to Luke and chapter 15. It's page 1688, Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Perhaps one of the best known passages in the whole scripture. The story of the prodigal son, the two sons. Luke 15 then, reading from verse 11. It says, And Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. There he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he'd spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. <coughs> and he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf. Kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. Now his oldest son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he had music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. His father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you. I've never neglected a command of yours. Yet you've never given me a kid that I may be merry with my friends but when this son of yours came who's devoured your wealth with harlots you killed the fattened calf for him he said to him my child you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours but we had to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost, and has been found. <coughs> I want us to look at this passage in three ways this morning. The first is one of the key truths regarding backsliders. <coughs> There's many applications, there's many uh, principles here 
within this passage, but it is talking about sons, and I believe we have one of the main um, truths regarding backsliders. Then I want to look at some of the great uh, truths regarding the gospel that we see here in this parable. And also, I want to consider some warnings. There are some very clear and strong warnings to sons who have lost their joy. Sons who have lost their joy. Those who really can rejoice with the Father. And I think that's a major theme as well in this parable. So what then about backsliders? It's a big question, isn't it? I'm sure many of us, maybe even all of us, will know someone who we thought was genuinely saved. We thought that they were genuine believers. We thought that there seemed to be evidence of real spiritual life. They seem to be following the Lord Jesus. They seem to be going on. They seem to be true worshippers. And, and now they are afar off. They're just a million miles away from where they should be. They're, there's no sign of them serving God. There's no sign of them loving the Savior anymore or doing anything. They seem to be dead in the world and careless about their spiritual state. Well, at the end of the day, this is speaking about a son, and I believe there is some instruction for us here. What about those who have professed Christ and who appear to have, uh, have come to know him, and yet now are a very long way away? Turn to Second Peter and chapter 2. Second Peter and chapter 2. It's page 2018. It's speaking of false prophets and false teachers. There will be many of those, we're told, in the last days. There'll be many false teachers, many false prophets in the church in the last days. And they will mislead who? Many. <laughs> most people. Most. It's over 50%, basically, the grammar suggests. Most professing Christians are going to be led astray. They are going to be led astray by false prophets, by false teachers in the last days. And we're given much instruction on how to recognize these people. But one of the main things is that they will be guilty of the error of Balaam. After the money. It's one of the key characteristics of a false prophet is that they're in it for the prophet. <laughs> they talk more about money than holiness or righteousness or anything else for that matter. And it's a sure sign that this is a false person. And it says that they will mislead many. They will train people, train their hearts in greed. And people will be more concerned with the things of this world than with the things of the Lord. They'll be misled. They'll go astray. Let's read from verse 17. It says, These are springs without water. Very similar uh, passage in Jude. Mm -hmm. Clouds without rain. They have an appearance, but there's no living water within. Springs without water, mists driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. Couldn't be much clearer, could it? Where are false prophets and false teachers going? Black darkness. 
For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, prom promising them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For af if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit. And a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. How do you know a dog? An unclean animal. A pig, a sow, a swine. How do you recognize one? They'll go back and be comfortable <coughs> with what pigs do. Pigs will happily live in pig's will. That's how you recognize a pig. It's quite happy. You might dress it up, put a nice suit on it, a bow tie, whatever, put a, whatever you want on it, and teach it how to behave like a Christian. But if it's still a pig, sooner or later it will find its way back to the pig's well. And it will be happy in the pig's well. But a son will always be thinking on the father's house. He might end up in the pig's well. He might end up filthy. But he'll not be happy there. That's the difference. If someone who's been genuinely saved and they go far off, if they are genuinely saved, There'll always be a remembrance. There'll always be an inner longing for the Father's house. And they can never ever be 100% comfortable in the pig's well. Not if they're a son. If they're a pig, they'll happily wallow in it. If they never were truly born again. They can happily wallow in the pig's well. They can happily go back into the world and enjoy their sin. But if they're sons, dear friends, there'll always be a remembrance of the Father's house. And they'll never be 100% comfortable in the pig's well. Do you understand? This was a son. He found himself in the pig's well. But he knew he shouldn't be there. Proverbs 26. <clears throat> from which is the quote. It says the proverb. Well, where is the proverb? It's Proverbs 26 and verse 11. It's page 1000. And 53. Proverbs 26, 11 says, Like a dog that returns to its vomit. There it is. That's what's been quoted in Peter. Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Various contrasts in scripture, isn't there? The wise and the foolish is one of them. 
It comes again and again and again. The wise man built his house on the rock. He's the one who hears the word of God and acts upon it. The foolish man builds his house on the sand. He's the one who hears the word of God and doesn't act upon it. We need to be doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. The fool is the one who hears the word of God and does not act upon it. The wise and foolish virgins. The wise were ready. They had oil in their lamps. The, fool, the foolish virgins were not. The wise and the foolish. And the fool can return to his own folly. Like a dog returns to its own vomit. But if he's born again, if he's a true son, he can't do it easily. He can't do it comfortably. Do you understand? Me? And that's the thing. When we know, when we look at people and we wonder and we see them and they're afar off and they appear to be walking with the Lord, how do we pray for them? What do we do? Well, the ultimate proof of whether they ever were true, truly said, truly sons of God, is whether they can happily wallow in the pig's well. Because if they can, it's sure proof that they're not sons. That they were never truly born again in the first place. And if they are sons, they won't be able to re forget the Father's house. There'll always be something nagging There'll always be something bothering them that they're not where they should be. And what is it that's most likely to bring them back? Adversity. Adversity, dear friends. If you're praying for backsliders, be very aware that that's one of the main ways that God brings back backsliders. He's literally stripping them of everything. friend of ours many years ago <laughs> fell into sin no question he was he was saved and quite a shock really and amazed that he didn't repent very very quickly didn't turn back and just couldn't believe that he kept on going in his sin you know it took to bring him back to God a stroke, paralyzed down one side of his body, still can't smile properly to this day. <coughs> it took him a visit to intensive care, dear friends, before he humbled himself and truly repented to come back to God. If you're praying for backsliders, be aware that that's one of the ways. Well, let's move on. Let's look at some of the great gospel truths in this <coughs> wonderful passage. <coughs> it says that he took, he took what he had and he wasted it. He squandered it with loose living. You know, we've been given one life. How many lives do we have? One. It's appointed for men to die. Once, dear friends, we're not coming back as butterflies, or dogs, or cats, or anything else for that matter. It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. And we've been given one life and one chance, one time, to get right with God. One time to repent and trust in the Saviour. And once this life is done, that chance is over. I was talking to somebody yesterday. I won't mention the church. But this young man was claiming to be a Christian. And he was, he was involved in teaching the children. But he believed 
in purgatory. <laughs> he believed people got another chance. And he was convinced it was somewhere in the book of Revelation. <laughs> but even though I gave him my Bible, he couldn't find it. He was convinced of any other weird and wonderful beliefs. And he's teaching children in one of the main evangelical churches around here. And he's not even saved himself, quite obviously. It's tragic. It's tragic. But we have one life, and we have one opportunity to get right with God. We enter this world with nothing, and what do we go out with? <laughs> None of my children sadly brought any money in with them. <laughs> They just seem to cost and cost and cost other. And none of us will go out with any. We're not taking anything with us, dear friends. We've just been given a life. And we have to decide what we do with that life because God has made all things for His good pleasure. We have to face the challenge that we are made because we are supposed to glorify and please God. That is the purpose of man's life. And if we never come to know him and to glorify him, then we will have wasted our whole life, our whole purpose, the very thing that we were made for. Actually got round to doing some DIY the other week, you'll be impressed to hear. <laughs> Was one of big investment. <laughs> Turned the water off, got the spanners out and everything, and got these little rubber things called washers because we had dripping taps. Well, it was more than dripping, it was constantly running out. <laughs> I, I just ignored it for weeks, and uh, eventually it just wouldn't turn off at all. Well, managed to get this thing off and there was a washer, except it was virtually non-existent. This thing, which was made for the purpose of blocking off the water, was no longer any use for what it had been made for. In fact, when I took the tap off, the tap head off, it just literally fell to pieces. It was perished. It was made for a wonderful purpose, to stop our tap dripping. So that I didn't have to get the spanners out, switch the water off, and mess about and waste half, half a day nearly. But it was useless. It was perished. And dear friends, we are made to know and to glorify God, and if we never come to know Him, and we never come to live for His glory, we're no better than a perished rubber washer. It's good for nothing other than to be thrown away. And dear friends, that is what will happen to all mankind that has never bothered to seek the Creator, to find out the purpose for their lives, is that they should know God, and that they should bring glory and honour and please Him. And at the end of that life, they will be of no use at all. They will be perished. And God will cast them into His rubbish heap. Into that place of blackness of darkness. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. To have known that you have been given a whole life before you. Come into this world with nothing, gone out with nothing, and missed the whole purpose for your existence. To have wasted and squandered the years, the days, the weeks and the months that God had given you to know Him and to love Him and to glorify Him. What a tragedy, dear friends. What a tragedy is life. This man, he wasted what he'd been given. And dear friends, we can just waste our life on our own pastimes, on our own pleasures, on our own desires, and never ever ask what God has required of me. And this man, he just wasted it all. He wasted it all. 
<clears throat> he went his own way. If you wanted to sum it up, it was really quite simple. He had a simple attitude. Give me, give me, give me. Didn't he? Give me, give me, give me. What's right at the heart of sin? Give me, give me, <coughs> give me. We think the world revolves around me. I mean, we do, don't we? It's even in our vocabulary. Where's here? Well, it's quite obvious where here is. It's here, isn't it? But here to you is over there. Why? Because you're the centre, aren't you? Of your thinking. You're the centre of the way that you look at everything. It's all about you. Well, dear friends, we need to get a firm grip on that, don't we? Because we're not the centre of this universe. We're not what everything revolves around, dear friends. It is God. It is God who is the focal point of all things. That this man, give me, give me, give me. You know our prayers can be selfish? Our prayers can be selfish. Oh, Heavenly Father, bless me, my wife, our two children, us four, no more. Amen. <laughs> Lord, give me, give me, give me. Jesus said his house should be a house of prayer for all nations, dear friends. We have a world out there that's perishing without Christ. And God has called us to stand before him, to minister to him, to pour out our hearts like water before him. And all we can pray about is something that's on our mind, some little imperfection in our lives, something that's bothered us so that we, we don't have a wonderfully comfortable life. It's tragic, dear friends. We can be as selfish in our praying as we are in our living. And this man... If you characterized his life, it was me, me, me. Living according to his fleshly desires. The scripture says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. He made himself an enemy of God. He had his desires set on the flesh and the mind and he was by nature, a children, a child of wrath. What was he doing? Just living for himself, dear friends. Just living according to his desires. Just living according to his sinful passions. Just living like everybody else on this earth. And he was an enemy of God. But something woke him up one day. What was it? It was the realisation, dear friends, that he was perishing. I'm perishing in this place. If I don't do something about this, if I don't get out of where I am and the way that I'm living, I am perishing. <coughs> Hell and judgment have become dirty words. Not just in the world in these days, but sadly, in much of the church. But it's the very realisation that we are hopelessly lost and facing judgment, dear friends, that will wake us up. I had very simple motives for turning to Christ. I knew <coughs> I was on my way to hell. Simple as that. I didn't have to look very long and hard at my life to know that if God was good and holy and righteous and true, I was in big trouble. And I didn't want to perish in hell. And I knew there was one. Praise God if you were brought up in a family where you got a good hiding. Anybody here? Praise the Lord. 
Thank God for parents who punished you. You know what that did, don't you? It instilled in you a very simple principle. Wrongdoing results in punishment. <coughs> you know we have a generation, possibly two generations now, who have no concept of wrongdoing results in punishment. And you know what you get when you try to share the gospel with people now? If God is a God of love, how could he send anyone to hell? Well, I didn't have a problem with God sending me to hell. Because I'd been raised with the idea that if you do something wrong, you get punished. And it's perfectly logical and reasonable for God to cast someone into hell. Because if they go in there a sinner and they can't be changed, what are they going to be for all eternity? A sinner, dear friends. And they'll just <coughs> deserve every minute of, of eternal damnation that they get. Now is the time. This is the day of salvation. This is the time when we can be changed. This is the time when we can be born again. This is the day when God will change our nature if we call upon him. This is the day when he can blot out our transgressions and give us new life in Christ when we can be born again. But except a man be born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. And if we are not changed, dear friends, and we die in our sin, and we stand before God as an enemy of God with a wicked sinful nature, we'll be cast into hell as enemies of God with a sinful, wicked nature and we will remain in that state for all eternity. Dear friends, people argue and say, oh, how would God send me to hell for something that only took me five minutes to do? Well, dear friends, we send people to prison for 30 years for something that took them a split second to do. Pull a trigger. It's irrelevant how long it takes you to <coughs> sin, dear friends. <coughs> it's the offence of the crime that's important. And all sin is against Almighty God. What woke him up was the realisation that he was under judgment. And dear friends, what brings most backsliders <coughs> up is the realisation <coughs> if they don't wake up and get out of their sin, they're going to perish. And we don't do anybody any favour by absolutely indoctrinating them to the point where they can't think any other way that once you're saved, you're all right. It doesn't matter if you live like the devil. This man realized that he was perishing. And so he got up. He realized he had to do something. I will get up and I'll go. Dear friends, there is something we have to do. Salvation is of the Lord. Yeah. But if we want to get right with God, there's something we have to do. We can't continue in our rebellion. We can't continue in our sin. Going to church is not going to make us a Christian. Living in a garage will not make us a car. Living in a field will not make you a cow. You need to be changed. You need to be transformed. And there's only one who can do that. And so the man got up and he said, I will go to my father. We need to get out and we need to go to God. He said, and I will say to him, there's something we need to say, dear friends, to God. Isn't there? Mm -hmm. I've sinned. I've done that which is evil in your sight. When David fell into sin, and we have that lovely psalm, Psalm 51, David says this, he said, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight. Dear friends, sin is evil in the sight of a holy God. All sin, all sin. 
he said, I, I need to get up and I need to go. And I need to say to my father, I've sinned. Dear friends, we don't get saved by telling God how good we are and all the wonderful things that we've done in our lives. We go and get saved when we get down on our knees before God and we tell him what a filthy, rotten sinner we are and all the sin that we need him to blot out and all the things in our lives that we need him to change. And I remember pouring out my heart to God on all the filthiness of my life and all the things that I knew I couldn't change. And I needed a Savior who could change me. I needed a Savior who could not only wipe those things out, but could give me a new heart and new desires and a new passion and a power to overcome them. Dear friends, we need to go to God and tell Him what miserable rotten sinners we are, what hopelessly lost and helplessly lost people we are, ones who need someone who can do a work in us, one who can change us, one who can transform us, one who can give us a new heart, one who can regenerate us by the Spirit of God. I'm a lousy, filthy, rotten sinner and I need a Saviour. Make me as one of your child's servants. Lord, I need you to do a work. I need you to make me a child of God. I need you to make me one of your sons so that I can serve you. I want to come and I want to live for Jesus now. So make me new. We need to get up and we need to go and we need to speak to him who alone can save. But he had to go with the right attitude, didn't he? Mm. <coughs> I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, he said. Are we worthy? Are we worthy before we get saved? No. It's God's grace and His grace and mercy alone that we go to Him for. I am not worthy. What are we going with? Lord, I've got all these wonderful gifts. I'll come and I'll offer them to you. Just think of all the things I can do for you. No, we're not worthy, dear friends. We're not worthy. I'm not worthy. Make me as one of your hired servants. We must be willing to come and serve him. Jesus must be Lord of our lives. You say, Lord of what? Everything, dear friends. Everything. Jesus said, except a man deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Unless a man forsake all his own possessions, give up everything, it all belongs to Him when we come to the Saviour. It all belongs to Jesus. We become His responsibility. We become His servants. We are bought with a price and we're not our own anymore. And the me, me, me and the give me, give me, give me must go, dear friends, when we turn to the Saviour. He goes. He's unworthy. And he knows that he needs a work to change it. One more thing. There had to be the shedding of innocent blood <laughs> in the story. They had to kill the fattened calf. The son was to come back. They had to kill the fattened calf without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sin. Dear friends, Unless Jesus had gone to the cross and paid the penalty and shed his precious blood and given his life and been offered as that perfect sacrifice for sin once and for all, our great high priest offering up himself and triumphing and finishing the work, there would be no forgiveness for any of us today. But praise God, that's what he did. Jesus came and he was obedient to death on the cross. And that's why he's been given the name which is above every name. 
That's why the name of Jesus is so precious. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ear. Well then, let's finish off on the warnings. There's some warnings here for miserable sons. I'm sure we've not got any here this morning. We're all joyful, aren't we? And rejoicing every day. No grumbling, no moaning. We're just so joyous in our walk with Jesus. What was wrong with this man? What wasn't wrong with him, you could say? He lost sight of the joy of heaven, dear friends. He lost sight of the joy of heaven. What is the joy of heaven? There is joy in heaven over what? One sinner who repents. I think most of the church has lost sight of the joy of heaven. How many people are actively involved in sharing the gospel that they might see one sinner repent and put their trust in the Savior. Dear friends, we've lost the sense of the joy of heaven. There is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who makes a decision for Christ. No. Repents, dear friends. Who changes his mind. Who turns from all his ways. Who turns from his sin. Who stops thinking that he knows everything and God's got it all wrong. And turns instead and says, I've got it all wrong and God has it all right. I'm sick and tired of talking to people. I don't know I've said it before, but I'm still sick of it. Talking to people who profess to be Christians and they don't believe the Bible. What's wrong with that? <coughs> well, they've not repented. <coughs> it's as simple as that. Repentance means a change in mind. I'm wrong. God's right. I lie and did all the time. God cannot lie. It is his nature. He is true. And the word of God is true. If God says it, I believe it. That's it. The whole scripture. God breathed. Not, well, you know, it's not all right, is it? Yes, it is. All scripture is God breathed and profitable, dear friends. It is the word of God. And repentance means we accept God's word. Everything in it, all that he says, is the truth. He lost the joy. He couldn't see God's joy over one sinner who repents. What else? He was looking down on others. He thought he was more important than other people. He summoned a servant. Who are you? Come here. What's going on in there? That kind of attitude. The scripture says, have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus. What's that? that we consider others to be more important than we are. Who's more important? You or the person that sat next to you this morning? Everybody's looking at the person sat next to you. I'm just, just weighing it up a bit. Yeah. Who's more important, dear friends? Well, if you've got the right attitude, the answer's simple. M -er. But do we really live it? Do we live as if 
Other people are more important than we are. Brothers and sisters in Christ are more important than me. He had a wrong attitude, dear friends, and he'd lost his joy. He'd lost his joy. What else? He was full of what he'd done for the Father. He was full of what he'd done for the Father. Hmm? I've been serving you all these years. I work hard. <laughs> Takes me hours to do what I do for the Lord. I do it every week. Without fail. I've laboured. I've toiled. I've done my bit. What's that, dear friends? It's self-righteousness, isn't it? Let's turn to Luke chapter 17. Memorize this verse, please. <clears throat> so important. It's page 1691. We'll read from verse 7. Luke 17, verse 7. Which of you, having a slave, ploughing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he's coming from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. What are we? Bond slaves of Jesus Christ, dear friends. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. We have no rights. We have no possessions. Everything belongs to the master. But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat. Properly clothe yourself and serve me until I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, what are you to say? Didn't we do well? I've had a great week serving the Lord today, this week. Boy, with all the things I've done for God this week. I've tithed me mint and dill and coming. Fasted twice this week. Right? Cut 10% off the end of my carrot and put it in the offertory box. <laughs> We know who that is, don't we? <laughs> it's the Pharisee, dear friends. <laughs> no. What should he say? We are unworthy slaves. We've done only that which we ought to have done. If we, dear friends, could live in perfect obedience and perfect service, in perfect consecration and perfect sacrifice for the rest of our lives, we've done only what we should have done for Jesus after what he has done for us. Amen? Amen. And we're unworthy and unprofitable servants. Watch out. When you're focusing on what you've done for him, dear friends. Because what should you be focusing on? He's done for you. What he has done for you. That's why it's so important that we remember him regularly. <coughs> we remember him regularly. It keeps a right focus. What he has <coughs> done for us should be forefront in our minds. Not what we have done for him. What else? <coughs> he said, you've never given me. You've never given me. What an attitude, dear friends, to the Father. Why haven't you answered me prayers? Hmm? Why doesn't God do this for me? Hmm? 
What an attitude, dear friends. Mm. He's done it for everybody else. Why doesn't God give me this gift? Or why doesn't God let me do it? Why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God answer this? You've never given me that. Are we grumbling, dear friends, about what we have in the Lord? They grumbled in the wilderness. They were mourning against Moses, but God says they're not mourning against you, they're mourning against me. Dear friends, when we're mourning about what we haven't got, when we're mourning about things, we're mourning against God. We're mourning against God. Dear friends, the more we grumble, the more we lose the joy of our salvation. We should be thankful. We should be rejoicing. We should be praising Him in everything. Give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Are you thankful this morning? Yeah. Were you thankful last week? Yeah. Or were you moaning about what God hadn't done for you? Yeah. And what He hadn't given you? Yeah. No, none of us ever do that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> and what was the Father's response? You have been with me. And everything that is mine is yours. Dear friends, if you are a child of God, if you are born again of the Spirit of God, God is with you. You have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God is with you. He is Emmanuel. You can draw near to God and He will draw near to you. You can walk with Him. You can walk before Him and if you are blameless you will know the nearness of God. And if we're not enjoying that and if we're not living in the wonder of it. No wonder we're so miserable. You've been with me all these years. And all that is mine is yours. We have the most amazing inheritance in Christ. Dear friends, what does it matter? What God doesn't give us in this life. It's temporary. It's momentary light affliction. Everything that we go through. Preparing us for the eternal weight of glory. Are we enjoying fellowship with God, dear friends? Are we appreciating the wonder that we can draw near to Him through the Saviour? That we have access into the Holy of Holies through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's amazing, dear friends. <laughs> Me, you. Sinful, wayward human beings, cleansed and brought near by the blood of Christ and given access to walk with God, to draw near to Him and to be with Him. To know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us, dear friends, day after day after day after day. We will but walk with him. And all that he has will be ours, dear friends. We are co heirs with Christ of all things. And we will reign with him. We'll reign with him as sons for all eternity. And dear friends, we can still moan and grumble and we can lose the joy of our salvation. Dear friends, may we take this to heart because we can be in the Father's house and we cannot go in to the joy that is there for us I close with one scripture turn to Psalm 73 page 941 Psalm 73 
is God's servant, Asaf. He's uh, got himself in a bit of a tizzy because he's been looking around. And there's a lot of wicked people doing really, really well. They're the ones that have got the nice cars and the nice houses. And they're the ones that seem to have no problems at all. And when he's thinking about this, it, 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 he gets himself in a real mess. Until he goes into the sanctuary of God, until he draws near to God, until he gets back an eternal perspective, and then he realizes where they're going. He remembers, actually, they're not doing too good, these people, because they're heading for hell. They're heading for hell. And why am I being envious about anybody who's heading to hell. Dear friends, why are you being envious about anybody who's heading to hell? Well, he comes into the sanctuary of God and he finishes off with these words from verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Beside thee I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from thee will perish. Thou hast destroyed all those who are unfaithful to thee, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. Amen? The nearness of God is my good. Dear friends, we can draw near to God. We have the wonderful and amazing privilege of being able to walk with the God who stretched forth the heavens, the one who knows everything, the one for whom nothing is too difficult. We can draw near to him. We can have fellowship with him. We can minister to him. We can praise him. We can thank him. He can speak to us, dear friends. We can know the blessedness of his presence and the nearness of God. He says, is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all thy works. Dear friends, we can be miserable sons in the Father's house, never really entering in to the joy that is there for us. May that not be so. If you don't know him today, if you've never truly been saved, if you've not been born again, this is the opportunity for you. Just follow the simple principles of the prodigal. Say that you're perishing. Say that you need him to do a work in you. And go and tell him about it. Go and tell him that you're a sinner who needs a saviour. That you need someone to blot out your transgressions. You need someone to change your heart, to give you new life. And you want to give him all your life. Lock, stock and barrel. Hand everything over to him and call upon the name of the Lord. Call on Jesus, because he is the Savior. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <coughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's a message there regarding backsliders. There's a message there, certainly, <coughs> for the unsaved. But dear friends, there's a good, solid few warnings for us that know him. May God minister that truth to our hearts today. Let's pray.